hope this is the first of a number of open uh, in the uh, in the department. Um, so I, I have two two ideas. One of a very theoretical one, and one of a very a very practical one. So this is going to be the theoretical one. So uh, I tried to throw in as much mathematics as I could in a uh, in a half hour of my talk. Uh, my aim is twofold. Uh, I want to I want to show you what can be done. I mean, this is a very small department, and we there's so much more that we can do. I mean, except we're very limited. I mean, there's three of us, right? So we can't do everything. We can't offer 25 different courses every semester. So I want to give you a glimpse of other courses, other other areas of CS that are interesting, and you can study on your own. You can study one on one, maybe on reading course, or you will study when you do. Uh, uh, a graduate degree. Uh, <coughs> the second part is more of a joke, but I really think that CS, at least there's a good chunk of CS that's part of mathematics, and you really should look at the, uh, the connections between the two. So, uh, I'm going to start easy, and I'm going to get more abstract as I progress. <coughs> programming languages. So you know a whole bunch of them. You guys program all the time, right? I love programming. I love programming. I love learning the languages. So here's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and, and this may look funny to you, but actually there's probably more code written in Excel than in many of these languages in terms of lines of code. Very unfortunate because it's definitely ugly, but you have to live with that. Okay, so, so how do we program? Well, we state a problem, we have a problem. Then we translate this into some programming language. We compile this language, well, sometimes it's interpreted. We execute the stuff. We look at the results and we say uh, something went wrong. Or, oh, that's interesting. You could model real life. You could model uh, some systems. You could do a number of things. But you look at the result. Now, this is this is how it works in our dreams. How it really works in practice, not always as nice. Uh, stuff like this happens all the time. Uh, Python or come expect exception in Java or memory fault if you're programming in C or C++. I mean, we see this all the time, right? Some of you should see this a lot these days. Um, so this is the reality. So how do we, what's the, what's the consequence of this reality? Well, one of the consequences at the very least. I mean, there's lots of time wasted, but there's more than time wasted. You guys are too young to remember this, but there was a war in Iraq not so long ago. And uh, even though the Pentagon did not advertise this a whole lot, 95% of the missiles missed their targets because of programming mistake. Because of a register that was 32 bits and was overflowing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's costly. Uh, X ray machines burning patients. That happened. Because of a idiotic reset of a, in, uh, uh, a preamble of some code. If you look at inside risk in communications with the ACM, it's not a problem that exists anymore, but if you go in a street, you'll see tons and tons of things. It's extremely interesting stuff. Uh, credit card numbers stolen all the time because of programming errors. I'd say Windows as a whole is a big programming error. Um, uh, because of the time wasted on antivirus and anti-hacking measures. If you run a good operating system, you don't need this nonsense. OK, uh, so solutions to the problem. Many of them, many, many, many of them. And there's no single magic bullet. So software engineering, the practice of applying state-of-the-art techniques to the process of writing code. That's one possible solution required, but not sufficient. Proving that the program is correct, starting from a statement to the program and going step by step. Proving that it is correct, a very mathematical, mathematical approach to programming. Very few people do this nowadays, but it's essential in some cases. Uh, looking at the language implementations, how do compilers, are compilers written? Do they actually translate your code properly? Do they interpret your code properly? So at the machine level, the processor is doing the work. You're writing at some level, C, C++, whatever. Is the translation actually correct? You'd be surprised to know that all the compilers out there 
are full of bugs. They do not translate properly what you're asking. There's a lots of very good research on this, very interesting stuff, because it's a hard problem. It's a very hard problem, so we need to look at this very carefully. Uh, and another one, language design. How do you actually write? What is the proper language to write a certain type of solution? Is there one language that will satisfy all the situation? No. Languages should be designed for the specific, specific type of problem you're trying to solve. All of these are worthy of uh, long study and long talks. I am going to look at mostly the last one, language design and language implementation. So what's the ideal programming language? This is no joke for some of us, but maybe not for all of us. So the ideal programming language is <coughs> do what I mean until finished. That's, that's ideal, right? No possible uh, way to misinterpret this, do what I mean. It's not necessarily what I say, it's what I mean. So there's no way that can be wrong, if it ever is wrong. Well, we're not there yet. Uh, we're getting close, though, sometimes. So this is where constraint programming uh, comes into play. It's a way to look at problems and express solutions to these problems in a very, very clear manner. This was written in 1977, it's still very true. Have we reached the level that we would have liked to have reached? No, not yet. But we're making a lot of progress. So I'll show you some of the progress of recent research. So uh, constraint programming originates in the 60s. First system that we considered constraint programming was Sketchpad. It was actually a system of geometrical shapes. You could move shapes around and they would not they would not go one on top of the other. They, they had a concept of uh, solid shapes. So when you go you stop there. It's still very much in use in robotics. I mean the idea that we're developing. Uh, nowadays uh, IBM has bought uh, iLog a few years ago, a company that was mainly constraint programming. Uh, Cisco, Cisco of the routers, Cisco of the internet, bought uh, uh, Eclipse Prolog, and Google has developed their own tool called CP Tools. <coughs> Those are not small companies, and they're investing heavily, heavily in constraint programming. There's a reason for that. They see how useful it can be. They see the potential for that, that kind of approach. So I'll show you a little bit about constraint programming. So let's say, and here's the here's a typical example. It's a puzzle that's been around for forever. Uh, uh, you're trying to solve the following. You want to assign digits to these letters. These are the letters of that equation. So S E N D M O R I have to be one digit from zero to nine, so that the equation is actually satisfied. So we should add this base 10, or, so D plus E, I mean 10 plus more is this, so D plus E is this, possibly with carry, et cetera. So this is what you're trying to solve. Could you do this by hand? Yeah, probably, if you work at it. But here is a formal statement of this problem, formal statement of this problem, in some language. But I think you'll appreciate the fact that it is very, very formal. It's just a statement of the problem. So I want a vector of these variables to take on values in this domain, zero to nine. So each one of them will have a value zero to nine. Very formal. Then I want S not to equal zero, M not to equal zero. Why is this? Well, if you look at the beginning, the statement here, it doesn't really make sense if I want to this equation to hold, I really want a four digit number here and a four digit number there. So I don't want this to be zero. I don't want this to be zero. You could interpret the problem differently, but this is the usual interpretation of it. Okay, so S not zero, M not zero. <coughs> now, what's left? Well, I want all the letters to be different. Maybe I forgot to mention this. I want all these letters to be different. Because you could say uh, zero, 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 plus zero, 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 plus, uh, not interesting. I want all the numbers to be all the letters to have a different digit. And finally, I want the equation to actually hold. How can I formulate this, that the equation holds? Well, here's one way. 
So S is a digit, so S times 1,000 plus E times 100, N times 10, and D, I'm getting sent, and I'm getting the four-digit number corresponding to this, really. Okay. So this plus this equals money. So do we agree that A, this really formalizes the problem? And B, I'm not specifying how to solve it. I'm just stating the problem. Okay? So this is a formal statement. I want to transform this into a program, an executable program. Don't blink. Here it is. That's the executable program. What's the difference? Very, very, very little. Everything in between is exactly the same. I'm defining a function of these parameters. And I'm saying, OK, start looking for the solution, essentially. That's it. This is the whole program. It's executable. It's written in a language called Prolog. There's no concept here of, oh, I'm going to do it. This is it. You state the problem. The, the compiler transforms this into something executable and does it. Now, clearly, something is going on behind the scene. And this is where it's interesting for us in terms of researchers in computer science. What's going on behind the scenes? So I want to give you a glimpse of what's going on behind the scenes. A simple example, and then a very, very complex example. So, uh, but first, it's, uh, here's a solution. You can check this actually works. I mean, you notice that all the numbers are there, all the ledgers have different digits. Uh, this is supposed to work, five, seven, two, yeah, okay. Okay, and you could you could ask for much more. I mean, this you could have solved by hand. I think you could have. I mean, if you worked at Google, if I change this a tiny, tiny bit, so uh, same kind of equation, but now I want to maximize this because there's possibly many allocation of digit to these letters that add up, but I want this to be as large as possible. So I want a maximization problem. That's going to be harder to do by hand. That's going to be considerably harder to do by hand. Well, in terms of the language, the only difference is this. So I'm going to define uh, S to be that sum, which is money. I'm going to say maximize S. Nothing else. I just want to maximize. So I, I'm telling it what I want and not saying how to do it. It's kind of nice. OK. So uh, and that's the answer you can. I'm bad at this. Okay, so it's not only for puzzle. I mean, it's used. It's really used. I said IBM, Google, uh, Cisco are using it. It's because there are applications for us. Uh, tons. So, what is constraint programming in a nutshell? In front of you, a declarative language. You declare what you want. You would like the language to be close to the problem area that you're solving. So there's not one good language for everything. Prolog is very good for certain things. There are other CP languages that are better for other things. Uh, I have examples in Mozart. I have examples in different languages. And, and really, the, the area that they target is different. Behind the scene, we have two things, domain reduction, propagation. And we have the search. Search, you all know, because you've done searches. You know what it means to search a, a, uh, a space. So I'll look at this a little more to try to give you a hint of what is uh, propagation. Here's a very, very, very simple program. I want x, y, and z to take on values in the domain 1, 2, and 3. So integers, 1, 2, 3. I also want these inequalities to hold. I want x smaller than y and y smaller than z. So you can solve this, right? So you know what the solution is. OK, let's see how you could automate the process of looking for this solution. And this is really what's going on behind the scene. Search and propagation. So search means what in this case? Well, it means looking at the whole state space of the system, that is, all the possible values of all the variables given, 
you can start assigning values to variables. How do you do it? There are many possible ways. Tons and tons of different approaches have been uh, studied. So let's look at the simplest approach. Pick the first variable in the alphabetical order, assign it the first value you can take. Naive search. Well, naive search means, okay, I'm gonna take x, I'm gonna assign value one. Then, how does that affect your state space? Well, now your inequalities are this. One is smaller than y, and y is smaller than z. Now you propagate. What does it mean to propagate? You, you infer some change in the value, some change in the domains of your variable from the new facts. The new fact is if I'm assigning one to x, what is the effect? Well, the effect is it changed the program somehow. The program is not x smaller than y, y smaller than z anymore. It's one smaller than y, y smaller than z. So what's the effect of this? What's the inference that you can uh, do from this? Well, the first thing is y has to be bigger than one, which means that y is not in the domain one, two, three anymore. It has to be in the domain two and three. We call this domain propagation or inference. Okay, now that you've done this, well, you go on searching. So one is already assigned. What's the next variable in alphabetical order? Y, and what's the first value it can take? Two, so you assign it two. So that gives you the new program. One is smaller than two, and two is smaller than z. Well, can you do from this? You search. Well, what's the only value that they can have? It's three, and you're done. You have a solution. Search and propagation. And so just uh, for clarification. <coughs> It doesn't actually remove like the the domain changes by virtue of the rules that you or the constraints the constraints that, that you have put in place, not because you've removed an element from the set. Correct. Correct. Ex extremely right. So when I say domain is reduced, it's reduced because of the change in the program in a sense, because I've assigned it value. Based on my understanding of prolog, which isn't that advanced. <laughs> Doesn't it search basically it would take it as a tree and it would branch off each ele each element of the set and then so like it would take the first element and then take the take the tail and then go from the tail and take the head and then the tail again and uh, go through the set that way. Well right. you're thinking you're thinking of tail and head in terms of a list, but it's not Yeah. Yeah yes, yeah. you're right. It's you can conceptually think of this as the search tree of all possibilities, mm -hmm. and he's going down one branch of the search tree. Okay. Yes, absolutely right. Now, this is nice. You could zoom in going directly into the solution. It's not always this case, right? If I have this problem, so x, y, and z in one, two, and I have the same constraint, well, you already know, just looking at this, that there is no solution. But, so how do you do this systematically? Well, there's one more thing that happens. So uh, you start the search, you propagate the new constraint, so that gives me that y has to be in two. Oh, y in two means that y is two. Okay, so one smaller than two and two smaller than z. Problem is, there's nothing else in z, right? In, in the domain that can satisfy this. So what happens here? Well, you need to backtrack. You need to go up your tree. Mm -hmm. So you go back up your tree, and you, you try what? You try the next possibility. So I tried one, I'm gonna try two. You get too small and y mm -hmm, already. So you backtrack, no solution. So yes, you go down the tree, and when you reach a contradiction, mm -hmm. you go back up, yeah. and then you try something. So this is as, as simple an example as possible of what goes on behind the scene in uh, a constraint programming system. Let's look at something more complex. Because clearly there would be no research to be done in this area if that was all there is to it. So there's tons and tons of different types of searches. We saw that you search, there is many, many more. And there's some based on very specialized algorithm. And the propagation can be of many different types. No, pro no consistencies what I've shown you. You look at the value, the possible values of one specific variable, we'll call that no consistency. You can look at two different variables, how they're related. So if something changes here, what's the effect there? So if you look at every pair of variable, we call that part consistency. There's a concept of path consistency, which is start somewhere in the known and look at all the possible consequences of the change here. Each one of them is costlier and costlier, but give you more inference. That is, it reduces the search space more. And I'll introduce you to one type of specialized algorithm, 
this is where I'm going. So within this big picture of what CP is. What type of specialized algorithm? Well, I want to look at integer linear programming. Uh, you may know this as the simplex method. It's used for linear programming and for integer linear programming. So what's this? Well, in, in invented by George Stanzig, there's a uh, close connection. Uh, he worked at uh, the Rand Corporation for many years. Invented this in 1959, roughly. Uh, what is it? What is it? And what does it do? Well, an integer linear program is something like this: maximize or minimize some function subject to linear inequalities. What can change here is the number of variables can be huge, the number of inequality can be huge, they can be of any direction you want, smaller than, bigger than, equal to. And you can have additional constraints like these variables must be integers. So this is an integer linear program. What Danzig invented is a way to actually solve these. Interesting. Hmm. So what's the connection with what we saw before? Well, if I know how to solve this, maybe I can use this within my propagation. Let's see. Let's see if this makes sense. So what Danzig really invented was a way to look at the space, that is all the possible values of these variables, start somewhere, and that somewhere could be random, essentially, and then follow a path in that space to the optimal solution. And if this is what you have in mind when you think about solving these inequalities, this is a very good image to have, a very good way to think about this. The algebra gets more or less complicated, depending on how you want to look at it, but this is the right image. You start somewhere, a possible value, and you follow a path. Now notice that the path doesn't go through at random. It actually follows the uh, segments, the I don't have the English word for this. The straight line segments that are the intersection of two faces. I'll come back to the vertices. Vertices are at these yeah. points. These are vertices. Yeah. Each one of those. Yeah. Edge. Thank you. <laughs> edge. Edge. Was it wasn't that hard. Edge. Follows the edges. Okay. So uh, now notice that this algebraic description seems very, very far away from my original type of problem. So this is one difference. Uh, the integer linear program is just linear inequalities. It's really an art to take a problem, let's say even send more money, transform it into this set of inequality. It's actually not easy. CP, you just essentially write down what you want, so it's very easy. So they're very far, CP are close, CP is very good at finding op, uh, feasible solutions because it goes through a tree, it finds a feasible solution really fast. If you're trying to maximize, well, you may have to look at many, many, many branches of the tree. Yeah. Not ideal. This guy zooms in towards the optimal point, so it's very good. Uh, these guys are very fast, these guys tend to be slow. Okay, so I want to merge the two. And this is an area of research of many, many people. I'll give you an example. Let's say I have a set of four employees, four tasks. You need to assign one employee to a task. You can imagine that some tasks can be done by some employees or not. Some tasks are fast, done faster by some employees than others. But still, you need to do all the tasks and you need to have every employee busy. I can actually formulate this as an integer linear program. This way, I'm going to have a variable <coughs> y of two indices, uh, i and j. And it's going to be either 1 or 0. It's going to be a very simple variable, integer, but two possibilities, 0 and 1. It's 1 if the, ta the employee i is assigned to task j, 0 otherwise. So if I do this, I have two constraints. If I sum for every employee over the jobs, it has to sum to 1. That is, I must assign a job to that employee i. So it's a linear equality. 
And in the other direction, for every job, if I sum over the employees, it must equal to one. That is, every task is done. So this is a translation into the set of equalities of the problem of assigning employees to tasks. So in this case, not too hard. Seems relatively easy. It gets more complicated, of course, in, in harder cases, but it's, it's doable. So there is a way to translate a, a word problem into a set of equalities and equalities. Now, disadvantage, 16 variables and 8 constraints. Seems a lot for such a small problem. If I do this in a CP way, I'm going to say, well, <clears throat> I need to assign, uh, so I'm going to have one variable per employee. The domain will be the tasks. And I simply want every one of these variables to take a value in the task, one of the tasks. And they must all be different so that everybody has a different task. And then I'm done. So uh, <clears throat> four variable, one constraint. That's nice. That's easy. But how do I solve this? OK, I give it to Prolog. It's easy. He does it. Uh, I am the one who writes the prologue interpreter. I'm the one who actually needs to translate this. How do you do this? Well, many ways. So if you know something about graph theory, this is actually a matching. You're trying to match this set of nodes, this set of nodes. That is, you're trying to pick edges such that for each one of these, there is exactly one of these. And you try to minimize the cost of the edges that you pick. So it's a minimal weight matching problem. Okay, does that help? Well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, it would because we know of algorithms to actually solve this specific problem. But if you have multiple constraints, so you need, let's say, x1 and x2 to be all different, and x2 and x3 to be all different, and x3 and x4 to be all different. This is what I, I'm illustrating here. There actually, if this is my graph, there is no solution. And uh, one, two, three, four, five, one, seven. It's not obvious, but if you try to assign any value for one of them, it will sort of propagate, it will force you to assign. So if I assign three to x4, then I cannot assign x5 to x4 because x4 and x5 must be different. So you must assign this. If you assign this, you cannot assign this. So you cannot assign this. You must assign this, and then you're back here. So you have a contradiction, and you have contradiction all the time. So that's kind of interesting. It means that simple matching theory doesn't work here. Hmm. OK. So can we extend it? Well, this is what we tried to do. Now you need a whole other branch of, of mathematics slash computer science called poly polyhedral theory. What's that? Polyhedral theory is the study of objects like this. What are objects like this? All the objects that you can express this way by set of inequalities. That describes <coughs> chunks, convex chunks, in the space. Now, the space doesn't have to be three-dimensional. It can be n-dimensional. But convex objects that have one characteristic, every side is flat. That's a bulk. So is there a connection between this and my all different predicate of constraint programming? Well, uh, I'll try to bring you there. But the typical question that people answer in polyhedral theory are the form, if I have a whole bunch of points, find the inequalities that bound these points. I'll give you a specific example. And I'll connect to all different. Let's say I, have, I want these two variables to be all different. They can take on, each one of them can take on values, any value between 0, 1, and 2. Okay. I can list all the possibilities, right? I can have x1, 0, x2, 1. I cannot have 0, 0, because they would be different. But I could have 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2. That reminds me of something we've been doing last week in <laughs> discrete structures. Yeah, OK. So you can count all of these. You can actually list them. Here they are. Now I can think of these as points in R2. 
this is a all different than two variables, this point in R2. Well, I can write the inequalities <coughs> that constrain these points. So x1 and x2 bigger than zero, yeah. x1 and x2 smaller than two, can actually draw this. So zero, two. Then x1 plus x2 bigger than one, that way. And x1 plus x2 smaller than two. Mm. One, 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 here. This is the area. So I've transformed this set of points into a set of inequalities that bound the same region. Now these points happen to be vertices of that area, right? Uh, zero, one, one, zero, etc. Okay. So there is a connection. Here's a bigger problem, timetabling problem. So imagine here or some high school, a whole bunch of students choose courses. Each course possibly has many sections and structure. Instructor teach certain courses. They have to meet at some point during the week. They have to have a uh, room assigned to them. Since my watch is wrong, you guys are better tell me when I have 10 minutes left or five minutes left or something. I just say this, keep going. Yeah. I, I don't want to go too far. Okay, this is actually a hard problem, NP hard. Non deterministic polynomial hard, meaning really hard, right? Okay, enough said. It's hard in a whole bunch of weird and wonderful ways. You take out some of the constraints that still NP hard, you take out a whole bunch of constraints that still NP hard. So it's excruciatingly difficult from a theoretical standpoint and a practical standpoint. Because in practice, it's even worse, right? I mean, people have certain requirements, you have to go to lunch at some point, etc. So this is really bad. So typically on a real problem, in the real high school, uh, it's impossible. I actually spend many years of my life solving this type of problem for, for a living. Uh, it's, it's hard, it's really hard. Okay, so what do you do when you're faced with the NPR problem? Well, you give up, that's one possibility. <laughs> uh, two, you approximate it. Three, you try to look at substructure of the problem that you can actually solve. Maybe this will lead to solving part of the problem. At the very least, it will lead to interesting papers that you can publish. Uh, so this is what we did. We looked at substructures, and we looked at this structure. What is this supposed to represent? Well, I have a whole bunch of variables. I mean, uh, uh, I just to tons of them. And these must take on values that are all different. These must take on values that are all different. These must be all different. These are all different. These are all different. These are all different. Okay, so this is what, this is the type of structure we looked at. Clearly, it's not entirely general. I could have a whole bunch of problems that have even more intricate structures. But I looked at this one. Why did I look at this one? Because it, it sort of is natural for the timetabling problem. For instance, if uh, Professor Black is teaching these classes, I invented these numbers, and we have students who take these classes. Well, they, there's stuff in common, right? He's teaching this. Marie's taking the same class. Uh, Stephen's taking this and this. So if I have a model where x sub i is the time slot of that course, time slot could be one from 43 or 64, depending on how many time slots we have in a typical week, my task is to figure out the time slot of that course. This leads immediately to that home structure. Here's how. Uh, let's say these are the variables assigned to the three courses that Michael Black is teaching. Well, they must all be different. Uh, Stephen has these three courses, one in common with Professor Black, so here it is. And uh, Marie and Michelle, this and this. So it's really a natural structure for that type of problem. Right? There's going to be tons of these cones in a typical problem. Tons and tons and tons of these cones. But they will be there. They will be interlaced within the whole framework of all the constraints. Will they represent all the constraints? No. There will be more. But I might get, if I can solve problems by looking at these, or if I can get a solution which satisfies almost all of the constraints, that'll be a good start. 
So this is an example of solving the subset of the problem, of the constraints. Correct. So looking at sub-problems out of the big problem, possibly thousands of them within one, and try to solve all of these at the same time, if I can solve one of them. Correct. So we're looking at substructures of the problem. So now, <clears throat> in practical terms, this is a typical high school that I was involved with. On average, uh, seven courses per student, and on average, three, courses per, uh, three sections per course. Of course, that varies a lot. Well, if you do this, you're led with something like this. You can't even write this, let alone solve it, right? This is, this is huge. So you have to be slightly more sophisticated. But let's look at this. So just notation-wise, so this is going to be the handle of the comb, and these are going to be the, uh, all the teeth. The difference is when I have a superscript for the teeth variables, and no superscript for the handle. So they share the first one. So each one of these correspond to these guys. So this is handle, and you can think of the first, all the front here being underneath the X2, the X1, and then underneath the X2, and underneath the X7. Right? So that's the structure, just, just notation. If you transform this into an integer linear program, why would I do this? because I know a Danzig's algorithm, I can solve these. Ah, well, I'm led to this. So do I have 40 million here? No, I probably have even more. Because for each one of those, I have a whole bunch of these inequalities. If you look at these in detail, if you're interested, this is this guarantees that every course has a time, and this guarantees that uh, every course of the prof has a time, every course of the student has a time, and every student has a, anyway, so. This gives me back the time from the x to the y, uh, r, r, which are binary variables. If you look at this in detail, and again, this is an art. Transforming a problem into this is kind of an art, but you get many, many, many variables. I'm interested in what? Well, maybe not all of them. Maybe only those that are vertices. Why? Because I know this is all I'm interested in, because when I follow the path, I follow from vertex to vertex. I'm not interested in all the other points in the in the inside of that space, they will never be optimal. It's only the vertices I'm interested in. Well, knowing the vertices is the same as knowing the faces. So I'm interested in the faces of that thing, that monstrous thing. So this is what I want. I want the faces. Well, it turns out I can. It turns out after a lot of work and a lot of sweat, we figured out that given a set, uh, given a, a comb, we get these inequalities, which have not, which are implied by the big mess you saw in the previous stuff. So, so big mess reduces to this. Still looks ugly, maybe, but big mess reduces to this. A lot of mathematics between the two, but this is the interesting part because this is much cleaner. This gives me this, 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 this. Exactly what's interesting about the set of points, and this could be huge, right? But I, I have exactly the faces. We call these the faces or the facets of the polygon. So, in, and there's various classes of them. I'll give you a specific example. So, this is this is a specific example of what you just saw. So, if I have uh, a handle on these variables, I, I'm taking a subset of the handle. So, the handle could be x1, x2, x3, the one we had before. And this is Mary's classes, but just a subset, x1 prime and x2 prime. And this is Stephen's uh, x3 prime and x2 double prime. Then here is a pair of inequality, right? I have an upper bound, lower bound on these variables that represents the facet. So I start with a bunch of all difference. I looked at the structure, and I got these inequalities. And you could have inequalities of this form, too, with uh, fractional coefficients. Turns out that for this small set, for the small example, there are 36 comb inequalities, 36 facets of that form. So we were extremely uh, uh, excited when we found this. We actually published two papers out of this, which is kind of fun. Uh, so what is it that we did? Well, wh what's the big picture here? So a user, somebody who wants to solve time-taking problems, write down, writes down uh, models like this. So all different and some variables gives me the domain for these variables. Could be integers, could be whatever I want. 
it could be close to the model problem, it could be close to what you're really trying to solve. So I want a language here which is close to the type of problems I'm trying to solve. If I'm solving timetabling problems, I should be able to say stuff like, here are my time slot, here are my rooms, here are my instructors, here are my students. If I'm solving graphical, I mean, robot control problem, I want a set of verbs that apply to robot control. So I want a language which is close to the domain that I'm trying to solve. Then what do I do with this? I translate this, I compile this into a set of linear inequalities. So a compilation phase, a translation from one language to another, a language which is close to the problem domain and a language which is integer linear programming applicable. And then you run this and you execute whatever you need and then you go back to the original problem domain and express this. So is this any good? In a few minutes, well, I'll show you some examples. So this is the type of problem we're solving. So we're just creating a whole bunch of all different, creating these randomly, creating tons of them. Uh, the key is these para parameters, the so number of variables, number of constraints, and the domain, the size of the domain. Just to, to see that it actually works. This actually works. So you create these, and these are three different solvers that exist in the domain. These are owned by Cisco. Uh, so in terms of the parameters increasing, you expect these are times. So you expect the time to increase. Each solver has different times. So this is slower than this, which is slower than this. Uh, this is our solver. This is our new approach. And at some point, I gave up on them because it took too long. And we can still solve problems considerably bigger and in very reasonable time. So this actually works. So it's kind of fun. Uh, you see results. So a declarative language, and I would like to spend more time actually defining these languages more properly. I mean, trying to think of the right language for certain domain. Even for something as simple as time that we don't really have a good domain. I mean, I like Prolog, but not, it's not ideal. Uh, we use polyhedral theory and graph theory to compile this into a set of linear inequalities, which is our right, the appropriate target language. And then we run this, we run uh, uh, simplex method, variation on simplex method to solve these problems. So what's the, uh, it's, very, it's a very, very hot area, this merging of these two. I think it's interesting. Lots of, lots of knowledge that you need to have from different areas. <coughs> it's not narrowly focused in one classical area. You need to know stuff about many different areas. Lots of very low-hanging fruits, lots of papers that we can publish, even as undergrads. We can, we can work on this and publish papers fairly easily. Uh, and lots of real applications. What you, need, what you need, well, you need this. Some of this. You need some knowledge of graph theory, of language, polyhedral, and, and you definitely need going to be working with different languages all the time and thinking about translating and thinking about mapping. Uh, I'll stop there. This, this will be neat. Um, so it sounds like the languages aren't really currently defined in that area for what you were saying. That's very true. I think there's a big, big uh, hole in constraint programming, which is how do you actually define good languages for the domain that you're trying to address? Currently, there's maybe four or five languages. I mean, Prolog, Eclipse Prolog being one of them, Mozart being one of them, Music being one of them. But they're all rather clunky. I mean, Prolog is probably less clunky of all, but, but even that is fairly clunky. So there, there is a whole research area about how to come up with good languages for the right domain. And from a naive understanding of graph programming, it's like, or graph theory, it's like you can kind of solve different, you can have a symmetric solution, you can have, um, you can generate sort of different configurations that maybe are positioned to solve it in one way or another. Is that a good way to think about different solutions or approaches? Well, yeah, that could very well be part of the a solution approach. 
you need to know that for certain type of graph problems, we already have these recipes, these type of solutions. So if you can recognize a substructure that fits into this, then yes, apply this, because we know how to apply this. And there's many such structures that are already known. You need to know some of them, so be able to recognize a sub-problem. It's, okay, this I'm gonna handle this one. This I'm gonna handle this one. This I'm gonna handle this one. This, uh, we don't know how to handle. I need to come up with something new. Yep. You said um, that there's a lot of working in different languages and then sort of putting them together. Is there much of a body of knowledge on that process? Like, is there some place you can direct people? Because that's something I'm having to do a lot with some work I'm doing. Uh, it seems like it's sort of a fly by the seat of your pants thing on that one. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be not entirely false. Uh, I'm not sure where I would point. I mean, translation, <coughs> I mean, compiler design, for sure. But, I mean, that's not quite enough. Yeah. Um, I don't have a good answer to it. But you're right, there's, there's lots of there's lots of them. Anybody else? Food for thought or food for the stomach now? <laughs> so it sounds like, um, so it's like it's a mathematical thing. So by taking CP and ILP, mm -hmm. um, you're sort of trying to, to bridge it in such a way that C could a program be structured so that it knows what propagation to apply on the fly dynamically? This is what we're trying to do. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to recognize that this, I should apply this thing. And, and right now, it's very much an art. And every solver has a subset of these, oh, if I recognize this, I do this. But none of the solvers have all of them. You know how many, so I spent I spend an hour talking about the all different constraint. This is one, one constraint, one type of constraint. We actually, right now, catalog about 3,000 different constraints that we use in constraint programming. Do we have good propagation for all of them? No, we have good propagation for some of them. We have some propagation for interactions between some of them, but there's tons and tons and tons of which we don't know how to propagate. We don't even know how to recognize. We don't know what the interaction is between any of them. So a language could be constructed to automatically choose which propagation, and yes. can that be done efficiently? Well, right now, people are trying. The best effort in that direction is called Minizing by people at uh, Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, and they're doing outstanding work, but there's lots to be done. There is lots and lots and lots to be done. Another question. I was interested in this stuff. Can this stuff solve um, race conditions in multi-threading to sort of decide optimal um, run times or procedures to run on the processor and then avoid. Mm -hmm. It's a scheduling problem. This is one of the first applications of 